Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Sustainable Resilient Longmont uh, webinar called Food Waste and the Climate Connection. So this is SRL's first webinar in a series that we'll be putting on, put on by the Zero Waste Committee. So Sustainable Resilient Longmont collaborates with the Longmont community to cultivate a sustainable and thriving city. As the hub for education, advocacy, and action, we support the three pillars of sustainability, environmental protection, responsible economic growth, and social equity. We focus on three main programs. We put on Longmont Earth Day celebration every year. Um, we work to get 100% renewable energy by 2030 for the city of Longmont, and we focus on zero waste. My name is Rachel Zelaya. I'm the program coordinator for SRL. And I have a special place in my heart for the zero waste lifestyle. I grew up in New Hampshire. My parents were homesteading. We had raised beds and composting and we lived on well water, which ran dry every August. So um, being a, a conservationist with water has uh, been a part of my life from the beginning. Um, then after college, I moved to West Africa. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I was an agricultural volunteer. And I lived in a little village that um, just lived the 100% zero waste lifestyle. Pretty much nothing was brought in. Everything that they used was produced there. And then there was no waste. Um, everything was reused and reused. And also the effects of climate change were present um, as far as def uh, deforestation, desertification, um, re decreased rainfall and food insecurity. So even though they lived this 100% um, zero waste lifestyle, they were being impacted by climate change. So I'm excited to hear what our speakers have to share today about the connection between food waste and climate change, since this impacts us locally here as well as our global family. So we'll be hearing from our panelists in a moment. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box and we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, and also our panels, panelists will be sharing action steps. Um, so if that's one of your questions is what can I do, um, we'll be putting all of those together in a slide at the end of the panel. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you so much for the great work each of you are doing in the field of zero waste. We'll be hearing from first from Naomi Kurland, who has spent the last decade working and volunteering in the environmental nonprofit sector with a focus on food waste reduction and rescue. She moved to Longmont a little over a year ago and is now the executive director of Longmont Food Rescue. She also serves on the boards of Colorado Eco Women and Sustainable Resilient Longmont, and she's the chair of our SRL Zero Waste Subcommittee. And after Naomi shares, we'll hear from Dan Mach, who's director of EcoCycles Composting Department and the CHARM Center for Hard to Recycle Materials facility. Dan and his wife are former Boulder County organic farmers, and Dan is passionate about connecting compost from food waste and other organic wastes to compost use. Dan is chair of the Lion Sustainable Futures Commission, co-chair of the Colorado Compost Council, and a member of Boulder County Resource Conservation Advisory Board. Welcome, Dan. And then welcome Stephanie Potter, who's an elementary school teacher and a STEM Explorers Advisor at one of the Longmont Green Star Schools, Eagle Crest Elementary. Stephanie has lived in Colorado for 28 years, Longmont for 17, and this is her 23rd year of teaching. She enjoys spreading the word about living sustainably and does her best to model these habits with her school and her community. So welcome to all of you and all of our attendees. And with that, I will turn it over to Naomi. Thank you. Just share my screen. And as Rachel mentioned, I am the chair of the SRL Zero Waste Committee and also executive director of Longmont Food Rescue. And I'm going to start things off today with some information about food waste and food rescue. 
So first off, let's look at some statistics on global food waste. Between a quarter and a third of all food produced worldwide goes to waste. The amount of land it takes to grow the food we waste is equal to a landmass the size of China. And just as a quarter or more of all food produced is wasted, a quarter of the fresh water used to produce our food also goes to waste. There are additional environmental impacts beyond the land and water wasted in our food production. On a global scale, our food waste accounts for an estimated 8 to 10 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions. To put it another way, if our food waste was a country, it would be the third largest producer of carbon dioxide. An international research collective called Project Drawdown measured and ranked the top 100 solutions to reverse global warming and identified reducing our food waste as the number three solution to reverse climate change. Addressing our food waste worldwide has the potential to reduce or sequester up to 94 gigatons of carbon dioxide over the next 30 years. So there is a great need to reduce our food waste, but there is also a great opportunity for global impact by addressing this issue. In the United States, the statistics are even higher. Up to 40% of all the food we produce is wasted, which works out to 133 billion pounds of food a year. This is expensive as well as environmentally damaging. I already mentioned the CO2 impacts, but food waste in landfills also releases methane gas, which is 21 times more harmful to our atmosphere than CO2. And we have a lot of it. Food waste makes up 20% of our landfill weight, making it the single largest municipal waste source. This inverted food pyramid is the EPA's food recovery hierarchy based on environmental impacts. So of course, the best solution is to avoid the food waste in the first place through food systems change in production, purchasing, storage, and distribution. But given a certain amount of excess food produced in the process, the next best thing is getting that extra food to those in need. Donating food keeps it in our food chain and out of landfills. If the food isn't fit for human consumption, it can often be fed to livestock, again, keeping it in a food chain. Anything that is no longer edible can be composted, which the other panelists will speak on in greater detail. The overall goal is to keep our, all our food out of the landfills, where it pollutes our atmosphere with methane gas. When it comes to land and water, Half of our land and 80% of our fresh water is used for food production, but a quarter of our fresh water is lost through food waste. Massive resources, time, and energy go into producing food that never gets eaten, while at the same time, we have over 50 million people in our country going hungry. Food insecurity affects more than one in 11 Coloradans, and almost one in eight children in our communities are hungry. The need is greatest amongst our most vulnerable populations. Roughly two-thirds of food stamp participants are children, seniors, or have a disability. As you can see, there is a significant need for hunger relief services and a huge opportunity in the form of food that would otherwise go to waste. Longmont Food Rescue helps bridge the gap between excess food production and the need for healthy food access in our community for people facing food insecurity. Our mission is to redistribute nutritious food that retailers have deemed food waste to feed hungry, homeless, and low-income populations directly. We receive food donations from grocery and convenience stores, local farms and farmers markets, as well as home gardeners. Their generous food do donations are delivered by our dedicated team of volunteers to no-cost grocery programs, community food sharing events, and other local food distribution hubs. Longmont Food Rescue is a relatively young nonprofit 
started in 2017. And over the past three years, we've steadily grown in our capacity and our impact. These charts represent pounds of food rescued. On the monthly chart, you can see the yearly ebb and flow of our seasonal farm and farmers market programs, which make up a significant portion of our rescue efforts. Our work is focused on just-in-time rescue of perishable food that would otherwise go to waste. And the last bar uh, at the far right is the food that was rescued in May this year. And you can see our summer programs are already off to a strong start. So let's talk about our programs. First off, our no-cost grocery programs provide fresh produce to low-income and assisted living communities. Think of it as a free on-site farmer's market where residents can shop for their groceries. They, the, setup and the, the setup and the distribution of the food is run by the residents. We have, uh, they have complete ownership of the prog on on-site program. We provide food access, but the programs are community-led and each site runs their distribution to fit their needs. And so the program may look different from site to site, depending on how the residents want to run it. We also offer free food distribution at our monthly community events, Produce in the Park. Similar to the no-cost grocery program, our Produce in the Park events are set up like a free farmer's market where anyone can come and fill a bag of fresh, fresh food to take home. One of our foundational goals is to eliminate barriers to access. So we never require paperwork or, or collect any personal information. Anyone in need of extra food is welcome. The park setting is a fun shared space where kids and families are encouraged to come for the food and stay for the community. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, this year we've had to shift our distribution model to produce in the parking lot, where our volunteers can safely pre-bag and distribute food through our new drive up, bike up, or walk up format. We're grateful we can continue to serve our community, though we do look forward to being able to gather in a park together again in future years. Fresh Food Connect is a mobile app that connects home and community gardeners with food rescue nonprofits. So a home gardener would download the app and input the food they have to donate that week. And one of our volunteer couriers will come by to pick it up during our scheduled delivery window and bring it to a food distribution site. If you're a gardener, this is a great way to make sure any of your excess homegrown food doesn't go to waste. And you can see in the picture, the courier is using our uh, electric trike that is connected to a trailer. So if you're a uh, Fresh Food Connect courier, you're welcome to use and have access to this trike to bike around town. It's really fun to use. These are some of our distribution partners, including housing sites that host our no cost grocery programs, community hubs that distribute our grab and go meals from convenience stores, as well as some food prep sites that make our fresh produce into delicious meals to feed those in need. The Westview Presbyterian Church Round Pantry is a distribution site that has also given us use of their parking lot for our produce in the parking lot events this spring and summer. And these are a few of our affiliated rescue and hunger relief groups. We wouldn't exist today without the inspiration, assistance, and support of Boulder Food Rescue and the Food Rescue Alliance. These organizations have spread this model of community-run food rescue throughout Colorado and beyond, and are committed to equitable food access for anyone facing food insecurity. There's a great four minute video about the Food Rescue Alliance that I don't have time to play in this webinar, but I'll share a link later in the chat and I highly encourage you to check it out. I also want to recognize Community Food Share in Louisville as our local food bank for Boulder and Broomfield counties. They are part of the Feeding America network of food banks and they provide food to Longmont through many programs and distribution sites, including the R Center and the Round Pantry as well as mobile food pantries. 
So they're a wonderful food resource in our community. They do a lot of great work. If you'd like to get involved with food rescue, there are a number of ways you can do so. First off, Longmont Food Rescue is always looking for new volunteers, and there are many ways you can volunteer. Delivery volunteers or couriers bring food from the donor to the recipient site, and there are a range of donation sizes depending on your interest in vehicle size. So some you can do with a bike and a small basket, others with a bike and a trailer, or using that Fresh Food Connect electric trike and trailer. And some larger donations are best suited for a pickup or an SUV. Then there are on-site volunteers who help with bagging and distribution at our Produce in the Parking Lot events and similar programs. Another way to volunteer is helping us with outreach, fundraising and connecting with new food donors. We're also grateful for Spanish speaking volunteers who are eager to connect with the Latinx community and help with bilingual promotional materials. If you're a gardener, you can donate your excess produce through the Fresh Food Connect app. It's really easy, has a great interface, and you can make sure those extra zucchinis or tomatoes find a good home. Another vital role is advocacy. This is something you can do in your daily life, in your community. Just ask your food producers and vendors if they donate their excess food, and if not, ask them why and whether they would be interested in donating through Longmont Food Rescue. We are always delighted to receive referrals and connections to new food donors. And just keep food waste and food rescue in your mind. Start having conversations with friends and families about food waste and share what you've learned today. You might be surprised by the connections and impact you can make by talking about these important issues. So thank you. And I'll hand it back to Rachel now. Thank you so much, Naomi. It's so inspiring to hear about Longmont Food Rescue and what you're doing. Um, my mom and I have a garden and I keep meaning to download the app and <laughs> get on the list. And now that's inspiring me to do that. I know we just had a bunch of spinach that we couldn't finish. So get that over to you. Thank you so much. So um, yeah, if um, panelists or uh, participants Attendees have any questions for Naomi and Longmont Food Rescue, then please write them in the Q&A and we'll get to them after we hear from the other speakers. So we were going to have Dan speak next. Um, oh, and Naomi just added a bunch of links over in the chat. Um, so feel free to copy and paste or click on those links and follow um, along with all of that great information. So I think that since Dan is still connecting, we will um, have... I think I'm back. Oh, you're back. Me? Awesome. Great. <laughs> okay, we can't see you yet. Um, yeah, I turned off my video because it seems to help the connection. Okay. So All right, well, are you able to turn it back on so we can see you while you're talking? Uh, I, I'm afraid it might kick me off, so okay. um, right. yeah, I'm nervous to do that. Okay, well, let's see how the screen share goes um, and make sure that we can see your presentation. Okay. Okay, looks like it's working. So, um, yeah. Dan, looking forward to hearing what you have to share from EcoCycle. Thank you. Always exciting. Um, so yeah, um, uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you all for, uh, for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, well, why composting is important, um, maybe with a little bit different angle than, you, uh, than you're used to hearing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the current status of uh, Longmont and Boulder County composting, and then uh, and then we'll talk about things you can do um, to advance composting locally. Um, so, um, what's the problem? Why do we care about composting? Um, so, um, the uh, 
without civilization, things, as you know, take care of themselves. Uh, nature composts itself. Um, where we have run into problems is, um, is that we have event, invented the modern landfill um, and modern agriculture. Both of those things have, have, uh, have created significant issues for us. Um, one is that we have this linear system of, of um, all of our resources shortly ending up in the landfill soon after we, um, after we extract them. So it's an extract and bury um, economy. Um, and obviously that, um, that is not sustainable. Um, to get my video out of the way here. Uh, okay, so um, as you've heard, actually, as, as Naomi mentioned, uh, when, you, when you landfill organic waste, um, you are creating methane. It's actually um, methane that's generated, uh, methane is a, uh, on the short term, it's 84% more powerful than carbon dioxide. And um, normally you, you look at a hundred year time frame, but we advocated eco cycle. So you hear more like a 23% uh, or 23 times more uh, powerful. The methane is 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, but we use 84 because we don't have a hundred years. We, um, so we, look, we use a, a 20 year time frame. Um, and methane only lasts about 13 years in the atmosphere anyway. So, um, and, and organic waste is a very significant part of our waste stream. It's, it's roughly 40%. That includes not just food waste, but yard waste, um, soiled paper, like a pizza box, uh, and clean wood waste. So um, you would think knowing that, um, we would ban land. We would ban organics from the landfills. And why haven't we done that? Well, um, in the West, the reason is is primarily economics. Landfilling is cheaper um, than than composting. So, uh, so that's that's our primary challenge. But we also have a a, a challenge of end markets. Um, in Colorado, there's there's actually very few commercial composters. In fact, on the front range, there is one uh, and they're, they're located uh, in Keensburg, which is, uh, which is a 52 mile one way drive from, from Boulder where, uh, where the EcoCycle trucks originate. Um, and they, and, and EcoCycle spends a lot of time convincing municipalities on the front range to uh, to do commercial composting, but it's all going to that same composter and that composter is um, eventually going to tell us, you know, we don't have anywhere else to sell this stuff. Uh, and it's, it's not as easy to compost as some, you know, food waste is not, uh, post-consumer food waste is, is not so easy to, uh, to compost. There's a lot of contamination in it. So um, the, the existing market, you would think that that composting generally goes to agriculture, but in Colorado uh, and much of the West, um, the market, the, really the only significant market is landscaping. Um, they, of course, there, there's organic farmers who really have no choice. They, compost is gonna be their primary source of nutrients. Uh, so organic farmers use, use it, but um, looking, at, you know, looking at, at the whole state, uh, the organic farmers are um, pretty insignificant in terms of total acreage uh, compared to uh, the rest of agriculture. So, to so the way I look at this is, you, you know, we're we're not getting anywhere with trying to ban organics in Col from the landfill in Colorado. That's it's kind of a non-starter because of those economics. So what about looking at the end markets? What about trying to increase demand? What about trying to get it into agriculture? So uh, as you, I'm sure, have heard, um, topsoil loss is a major problem worldwide, and that is, um, and Colorado is not immune from that. Um, and that is because we have this sort of race to the bottom agriculture going on that, um, that only values, you know, how, how cheaply can you produce a crop? It does not pay a farmer to um, 
to build soil or to take care of their soil. So, um, so what can we do about that? Um, and how do we get compost more used in agriculture? So one thing we could do is, uh, is try to quant quantify the, the benefits, the associated benefits, uh, like you've probably heard that, that if you are um, if you're composting, you're, you're also saving water. Your, your, your soil is better able to hold water uh, and, you're, uh, and you obviously need less fertilizer. Um, you, um, you're, you are less susceptible to, your, your crops are less susceptible to disease. It's really tough to quantify all those things, but that's, those are efforts that are underway. It, it, it happens to be very um, location specific. Um, you know, those benefits in uh, Colorado or even the Front Range are going to be different from their from the benefits elsewhere. So, it, so that's a major challenge. Um, how about looking at uh, another single benefit, carbon sequestration, which I'm going to talk about here. So, so carbon sequestration. So this this chart is uh, this little graphic is very much like the um, the the um, uh, the organic cycle nutrient cycle chart that I started with. Uh, and basically what this is showing is that, um, that compost and plants can sequester carbon long-term in soil. Um, so uh, compost by itself um, happens to be about half pure carbon. It's about 50% pure carbon. So simply by the act of applying compost, you are applying a stable form of carbon to the soil. And it stays in the soil long term, a lot of it does. Um, also, um, you are helping to um, grow more plant matter, grow, um, grow uh, longer roots. Those things also, um, so, so photosynthesis, plant growing, plants dying, plants um, decomposing, um, a lot of that is uh, some of that organic, some of that um, that carbon is released back into the into the atmosphere, but a lot of it um, stays in the soil long term. To the point where, uh, if you look at it globally, if you look at if we were to um, build soil and apply compost um, in a concerted effort on broad acre farming worldwide, uh, that may well be the best tool that we have uh, for carbon dioxide drawdown to get us out of the, uh, the climate change, or, or at least to, you know, to, to start to reduce the climate change impact that we're, that we're feeling right now. Um, and the, the beauty of this is that, there, that you're really solving three problems here. You are, you're working on, um, Drawdown, as I say, you're you're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, you are building soil. You're re, you're restoring that lost topsoil, and you are uh, producing more nutritious crops. Uh, we, our food, our carrot, a carrot that you eat today is uh, generally not as nutritious as a carrot that your grandparents ate, and that is because of um, uh, depletion of nutrients in the soil. So when you are sequestering carbon, you are building soil, and you're also uh, making more nutritious food. So um, that's the why. Um, now I'm going to talk. Just I'm going to just run over some uh, statistics on where uh, where Longmont stands in its uh, organics diversion. So I'm going to start with Colorado. So this is a um, this is a screenshot from a an article uh, or a, a a report that that EcoCycle produced. It's available on our on our um, website. Um, this is the 2019 version. The 2020 version is coming out very soon. But it shows you that uh, in terms of pounds recycled per person per day, uh, it, this includes organics. Uh, we're not doing so well in Colorado. Uh, and here is, here's a little more specifics on that. So our, between recycling and composting, we're only, as a state, we're only diverting 17.4%. The rest of it is going to a landfill. Um, 
and that is uh, that is way on the low end of uh, of uh, the, of the states. If you look at cities, um, you see a different story, especially locally. There are a lot of cities that are doing way better than that. Uh, and, and Longmont is right in there. Uh, Longmont is, so, so these are the 10 best cities in, um, the, in the front range. Uh, Longmont is, uh, what is that, number five. Um, and, and then you can see by comparison some of, the, some of the standout cities that are outside the front range and keep in mind that, that once you venture outside the front range, the, the recycling and composting infrastructure is vastly reduced and that's why, we're, um, that's, that's why our rate is so, is so low is you know, a lot of the state is very rural. Uh, so here is Longmont by itself. Uh, uh, so this is the um, this is the subscription rate of uh, various containers. So um, what what I uh, what I want to point out here is so this red line on top um, that is the big 96 gallon trash can. So these are the number of subscriptions uh, over time, and you see that the uh, people are swapping out slowly their big trash cans, and they are instead getting more of the smaller 48-gallon trash cans. Um, and you see that they are also um, uh, cons slowly but steadily moving to every other week trash as they add uh, the um, opt-in composting program. So these two, these two go hand in hand, the green and the yellow, um, that people are, um, people are finding that as they, uh, if they have a compost bin, they, uh, they're finding, you know, I guess I don't really need weekly trash collection. So, um, so you know, this is, so uh, Longmont has an opt-in program where you, um, you have to subscribe to um, uh, you have to go to Longmont website, which I'll come up, which I'll I'll put up in a, in a minute. Um, so you have to make the choice to compost. It is not automatic, um, so it's that that means that you have kind of slow growth. It takes a long time to get there, but but this is this is impressive. Uh, so overall, um, so the opt-in rate is twenty one is is twenty percent. Uh, that's that's pretty good. Um, it's I think the program is uh, what five years old now. Um, it's th that's pretty good for opt-in. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what uh, what we can do to improve that. Uh, what what you can do to um, to improve Longmont's rate to uh, and just to advocate for and and uh, and make composting more available. Um, so one thing, uh, if, so if you are, if you have a single, single family home, number one, what you can do if you don't already is subscribe to Longmont's opt-in program. I'm guessing that a lot of our listeners probably already do that. Uh, um, another thing that's super important is to advocate for universal zero waste ordinance, um, such as Boulder has, um, in, in Boulder, as you probably know, um, you are required to subscribe to a compost service, and you're required to uh, uh, to have compost bin. So, and that that that's true for residents, that's true for uh, businesses, and that's true for institutions. They all must compost in in Boulder, um, and I'll have a slide showing the the impact of that in a moment. Um, so, so that's something that I know um, some folks in Longmont are working on, um, or at, at the very least, you know, can we do an opt-out composting program instead of opt-in? That will raise the rate. Uh, multifamily and commercial sites, uh, what the, really, you, you'll see a slide in a moment that, that shows the, just how important universal zero waste is um, for, for those sectors. Um, Support the Boulder County Compost Facility. Uh, if, if you haven't heard, um, there is a, a, a compost facility that is uh, being planned right now. It's going through the land use um, process right now. There's a great site and they have a great plan um, and, it's, um, and it's something that's very worthy of support. 
uh, and then if, and then compost at home if you don't. So I'm going to run through these uh, in a little bit more detail quickly. So uh, so here is a screenshot from the City of Longmont opt-in program. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, this is where you go to. Um, uh, to participate in that program. And of course, um, these links will be available at the end of the presentation. Okay, here is the slide for the impact of universal zero waste. So this is, this is City of Boulder Organics collection. So what you're looking at here is, uh, so City of Boulder started uh, residential curbside collection in 2005, that's the white line. Um, you see this dip, this first dip is, um, at first it, they did a one year pilot and then they stopped the pilot while they, um, you know, did some planning uh, from what they learned from the pilot. And then they, um, then they opened it back up and, 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 and uh, had citywide uh, residential subscription. Um, but the, uh, the blue line is the commercial diversion rate. And this is almost entirely uh, uh, non post consumer, it's like it's, it's pre consumer post industrial um, organic waste that so if you're a major generator of organic waste, it's, it might be worth it to you to uh, just to, to send it to a compost facility. But if you're, you know, if you if you deal with with post consumer, maybe not so much. But um, but the jump from 2014 to 2015, um, that's that's because of the universal zero waste ordinance. Uh, so you know the the um, that made a huge difference in getting businesses on board. As you can see, you know multifamily um, that is still the biggest challenge. Slowly but surely, um, we're we're making progress, increasing the rate for multifamily, but that involves you know sort of a mix. It's it's a combination of that commercial entity, but a lot of folks need to be educated. So so it's tough. Um, the so the Boulder County Compost Facility. Um, so there is a uh, there's a great site. It's on uh, 287, just north of Highway 52. It used to be a, a a nursery. It happens to be. Um, now it's now it's a bunch of mature trees around uh, surrounded by agriculture, and that that site was chosen because it's number one isolated and number two it's surrounded by agriculture and Boulder County um, has a plan to actually um, uh, they're not they don't want to just compost they want to create compost and create an incentive as I mentioned earlier for farmers to use it so what they're um, uh, I helped create a pro forma that shows that if they uh, were to uh, sell compost to farmers who make a commitment to uh, to be carbon farmers, um, sell that compost to them at a at a rate that's comparable to the to their cost to spread fertilizer currently. Um, so it's just a it's a tweak on the on the financials for that um, for that. Um, facility um, and that facility is uh, it's it's going these these pictures are um, uh, it's it's this is a type of composting that that minimizes odor that's your big problem with compost facilities um, so this is a um, this this pic this top picture is showing an air, the aerated floor so you can actually um, either push or air push or pull air through all these holes in the floor um, and you and you compost inside these bunkers. So it's really, it's a little bit like what you do at home. It's not uh, long windrows like you may have seen at, at other compost facilities. Um, this is a, a highly controlled um, compost facility that I think is, is, um, is suitable for, uh, you know, the semi-urban situation that we have in Eastern Boulder County. So really excited that is um, that is slated to open in 2022. And I, um, because they are going through the public process right now, um, I highly encourage you to, um, uh, to advocate for it, tell your commissioners that you want it. Uh, okay, and then um, backyard composting, I'm just going to mention that uh, because uh, Stephanie is going to talk about it, uh, about composting at home. Um, 
EcoCycle has a lot of resources um, about composting at home on their on their uh, on our website. So I'm just putting this link here for folks. Um, there's there's all kinds of information about uh, uh, about composting at home. And lastly, I'm going to um, I'm going to end the presentation with um, a um, just take a couple minutes to talk about this program that we're doing. So I mentioned carbon farming uh, that we're that we're encouraging. We're finding we're trying to find a new value for uh, for uh, for our local farmers to use compost and build soil. Uh, and part of this is um, is that we need uh, the general public to you know to to understand the opportunity here and to to help push uh, the conversation towards um, towards building soil towards towards um, towards valuing um, carbon farming towards uh, carbon farming meaning farming to build soil um, so so what we're doing um, to um, to educate and and advocate is we are doing a citizen science project and we are um we're we 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 have a, a first phase of it that we're in year two right now of of a three-year study we're actually doing science in people's yards seeing if we can measure the amount of carbon being sequestered in their soil when they apply compost and a few other treatments um and uh, and that's a limited scope um trial but we are now about to launch a second phase that is um, it's going to be a more open um, form of uh, it's going to be essentially the same um, but it's it's going to be a little more uh, DIY um, kind of approach where um, you can uh, attend trainings uh, but you are um, and we 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 teach you how to uh, take soil samples. We teach you how to um, uh, use a uh, a phone app to a USDA phone app that helps you record data um, that that uh, that will be part of the the database that we are um, that we're using. Um, and it's uh, it's geared to being a a family project. So it's um, so it's a fun thing that you can do uh, with your family while everybody's um, staying at home. So um, if you there will be more information about this coming soon. We don't have a web page yet. Um, I think in a week or two that will be live. Uh, meanwhile, if you are interested in participating in our carbon farming program, um, all you need is a little patch of yard, a little patch of grass, um, and a, um, a cell phone, and 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 an interest to learn. And you can email Rosie at ecocycle.org and um, and 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 be on the list to, to hear more about that. So that is the end of my presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. Really fascinating. I'm excited to hear more about that carbon farming um, uh, on, on the lawn and seeing how, how much of a difference that makes, um, especially with water conservation. So if people have questions for Dan, please type them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and welcome Stephanie Potter. We're excited to hear about Green Star Schools and what's happening at Eagle Crest Elementary here in Longmont. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, I learned so much from those two first presentations. I wanna take that stuff to school. It's really exciting to hear about. And, um, very cool. All right, so I think that is working. Let's see. All right, great. Well, I'm from Eagle Crest and we're a leadership school. And um, I'm going to talk about two sustainable programs, sustainability programs that we have at our school, um, Green Star program and a food rescue program. Um, we've been a Green Star school since 2009. And we're so appreciative of being able to participate in that. Um, the first year when we started, we learned about what we could compost and what we could recycle. And since then, our program's really grown and we've been inspired to implement many sustainable projects. 
And being green has become a proud part of our school culture and our identity. And students who've been with us since kindergarten think this is just how all schools are. Um, they don't realize that ours is really unique. We'd like to spread it so that all schools have this too. Um, all of our green initiatives are student, staff, and community driven, and our entire school participates in it. Um, Katie Schwartz is my partner um, with this, and she and I have a group of about 30 kids. They're fourth and fifth graders, and they meet before school. And they're called the Eco Eagles, and they, um, they sponsor our program and, and lead it. And we're also sponsored by our school district. There's two programs that um, help us out, which is the Resource Wise program and also the STEM Explorers program. Oh, the slide's not forwarding. Oh, there it is, good, okay. Um, our Green Star School uh, program is sponsored by EcoCycle, of course, and our school looks a little different because we have compost and recycle bins in the cafeteria and in all of the classrooms. We have reusable trays and utensils in the cafeteria. And we reduce our waste in our restrooms by um, composting our paper towels. And then EcoCycle does lots of classes with all of our classrooms and assemblies and that sort of thing. So e the Green Star School objectives are to reduce waste, to increase recycling, to implement the collection of compostables, to improve environmental awareness and motivate participation, and also to lower each school's trash bill. And there are many ways that we develop sustainable habits. Um, EcoCycle, of course, provides us with experiences and classes, and they help us celebrate our successes. We let our community know how much trash we've reduced, if we're sorting correctly. We just celebrated 10 years of being a Green Star school. Um, we do our best to make composting and recycling simple and easy. Um, so we have clear signage around the school, um, pictures and words, and especially for the little kids, um, we have posters that actually have the physical objects on them so they know where to put things. And then we have um, color coding of our bins. So blue, for example, in the classroom, you have a blue bin for recycling, it's also in the pod, and it's also in the cafeteria. And then we provide guidelines for our teachers and students um, so that they know what goes where and what our expectations are. Um, in our cafeteria, we have a program called Green Star Ambassadors and anybody can participate in this. They don't need to be in the Eco Eagles group. Um, these kids monitor the trash, recycle, and compost, and they help out with the food rescue table, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. They also clean the tables and sweep the floors, and the older kids help the younger kids. And um, this has been really great because it, it connects our kids more with, with our community, and it really promotes buy-in. And I thought um, I would just show, we have in informational videos that we share with um, our students and staff, and I thought I would play part of one. Um, we'll see if this works. Oh. So we might have to wait just a minute for it to go. Hmm. Well. Looks like maybe it doesn't want to go, so I will skip that. But it basically just shows how um, what we do um, in the cafeteria, and um, this will be in the links at the end, so you can you can watch it then. Hopefully, this will keep going. All right, good deal. All right, so EcoCycle um, and Green Star also sponsors many other activities at our school, such as zero waste events. They teach us how to do that, and our PTO has been amazing, and they sponsor. Um, our zero waste events. This is a laps for leadership event where we had um, fresh fruit and we all brought our own water bottles. It was great. 
They also sponsor a waste-free lunch contest. For one week, we try to reduce our trash as much as possible and not use our, lose our utensils from the cafeteria, which is a problem. Um, but we try not to do that and bring, um, bring zero waste lunches. They also um, provide mini grants for schools. So in the past, we've used these mini grants to purchase materials to build green kits for all the classrooms. So now all the classrooms have these and they're just reusable so that when we have parties or snacks, um, we're not producing any waste. Um, and EcoCycle has also taught us about um, vermicomposting or worm composting. And some of our classrooms have these bins. When we first started, um, when we first started out as a Green Star school, we, we got training in this. Um, so these are really fun for the kids. Um, they're a great hands-on demonstration of decomposition and food chain um, and waste reduction. And we also study the worm life cycle and the kids care for the worms in here and they feed them um, our vegetable and fruit peels, dry leaves. I bring in coffee grounds um, and they make sure our compost stays in balance is Dan mentioned it can get smelly if it's out of balance. So they have to make sure it stays in balance. And then we use the worm castings um, for our schoolyard gardens, which, is, um, which has been really fun. So um, many kids like to, um, they learn about these in class and then they say, well, I wanna build one at home. So I'm just gonna share with you how to make one of these at home. It's very simple. Uh, you just need a bin. We just used a 10 gallon storage bin. And then you drill holes in the top and on the sides about two to three inches apart. And then you prepare bedding, which is just newsprint, not colored newsprint, just the black and white. The colored um, can have toxins in it. We don't want to um, hurt the worms. So you rip this up into shreds, you wet it so it's damp like a sponge, but not soaking wet. And then you add some soil, two to three cups of soil. And then you can add the worms and then you can start feeding them um, and it's just really great to watch everything decompose and then to use it um, in our garden. So that is how you do that at home and there'll be links at the end if you are interested in doing this. Um, other activities we've done at school because we're a Green Star school, we've done energy saving contests and those have been supported by the Resource Wise program at our school. We've done water audits both inside and outside supported, supported by um, STEM explorers. We have done paper waste reduction projects. We have plants in all of our classrooms to help with clean air. We do energy audits. Um, we have gardens at our school, and right now we're working on um, butterfly gardens. We have milkweed growing there. We planted those milkweed in our compost first and then planted the seeds here, so that was a really fun project. Um, many classrooms and students have taken on projects themselves. We have a class that did a plastic straw use reduction project. We have kids who did a marker drive. We had a teacher who asked if we could use, get reusable K-cups for the staff, which we did. And then those who don't use them, we recycle the ones that are not reusable. Um, we had some students come up with the idea of earth-friendly cleaners. So now all the teachers have those and we refill them. And then we have our food rescue table, which I'm going to talk about next. All right. so. Um, because we were a Green Star School, we were invited to participate in an EPA food waste reduction event with EcoCycle. And um, the kids um, learned about a food rescue table there and they were super excited. And when we got back to school, we asked our principal if we could start one. And he said, yes. And then as it turned out, um, a district, our Shelly Allen, who's our uh, director of nutrition, services was at the event too and she was thinking about doing this for the entire school district so we became the pilot school it worked great um, it was uh, it's just it's, it went really well and now um, our school district has standard operating procedures for becoming a food for having a food rescue program at schools and we've got 13 schools participating so far so we want to keep spreading the word so that um, more schools participate so a food rescue table is 
simply a table. This is what ours looks like. We have a cooler, not the, um, the tray with the ice in it. We have a real cooler. Um, but the kids can put their unopened food in the bins. Um, so prepackaged food can go in there and whole fruit can go in there and also milk and cheese and yogurt can go in the cooler. And then um, the food is available during lunchtime for kids to eat or um, it is also put out during the day for snacks who kid, for kids who don't, don't have a snack at school. And then the cafeteria also reuses um, the food. And those are the items that, some examples of items that go in it. Um, so um, we do a lot of education around why we would want to re rescue food. And this has already been discussed, but these are some of the kid resources that we use and the topics that we talk about and we talk about solutions. So we do that before we start our food rescue table. Um, and then everybody's a food rescue hero. So there's a bulletin board um, in the line where the kids stand to get their food so that they can um, choose, they can think about what they want to take for to eat and that, that um, bulletin board is changed every day by students. It's a job and they put up the meals every day. And so by the time the kids get to the counter, they can think before they take the food. Do I really want that? Do I really need that? Um, we encourage them to, to take any extra food to save to eat it later. Um, that's especially easy if they have brought their lunches like a, a box lunch from home. Um, and we also encourage them, of course, to put any of their unopened food or whole fruit into the bins. Um, we have expectations in the cafeteria of just, we teach the kids, of course, to be respectful and polite and appreciative of their food, um, to clean up after themselves, to think before they throw anything into the trash. Can this food be rescued? If not, if it can be, where does it go? We encourage them to use the food rescue table during lunch if they're still hungry. Um, and we also have, um, we sent information home to parents um, about this to talk about ways to reduce food waste at home. And we encourage the parents to pack, um, to pack the food the kids will eat or kids can make their own lunches, which is even better. Um, we collect data on how much food we're rescuing. So this is another student job every day at the end of lunches. Um, a student will go and count all the food that is left. And the actual numbers are greater than this because of course the food is being consumed during lunchtime. But this is what's left at the end of our, our day. Um, and the cafeteria can use this data also to see what kids are eating and what they're not eating. And then they can order accordingly to what our kids are are enjoying. And these are just some of our numbers. Um, as you can see our totals, we've, we've rescued over 9,000 items and we've saved um, $3,350 so far. Um, so that is pretty significant. And when the kids see these numbers, um, they get really excited. Um, they get really excited too when they see it, when they count the number of clementines or whatever they're counting. And if there's a lot one day and then they're gone the next, it's, it's just, it's really, interesting and exciting for the kids to see. Um, some other uh, food rescue resources that we um, have and that we were inspired by, um, the one on the left is a K through 12 food rescue um, database. It's a national database that you can participate in and our numbers aren't quite correct, but it calculates um, CO2 reduction and how many meals you've saved. And then um, Live Well Colorado and Smarter Lunchrooms, the Smarter Lunchrooms Movement and Chef and Foundation, both, they, all three of those have great information about healthy school meals and how to decrease food waste in the cafeteria. And we used all three of those resources when we were um, figuring out how to do the food rescue table. So um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, things that have been successful in maintaining both our Green Star program and our food rescue program. So I think the biggest thing is just to start small and make things as easy as possible for people to participate in. That's one thing. And another thing is include everyone. Um, all of our projects, 
you've seen have been ideas from either students, staff, or community. And that really gets a lot of buy-in and that lets us work together. Um, and that's been really successful too, that we listen to, to our community and our students. Um, we give our kids voice. Um, we have a couple of blogs that we maintain um, and the kids write most of the blog posts. And that way they can write about what's important to them. They can show off their projects. They can talk about the community outreach we do. So that's a fun thing to do. And then um, we partner with everybody we can partner with. We're so appreciative of EcoCycle for sponsoring this program. Um, our custodial staff is huge in being, being able to implement both programs because they really know the ins and outs of the school and they can help make the program successful. Our kitchen staff and the district nutrition services department are um, really important because they pro they've provided reusable items for our cafeteria. They encourage kids to take only what they will eat. Our administration um, helps with logistics and staff and student buy-on and they support assemblies and classes. Um, and our PTO has been amazing. They've given us lots of financial support and help with zero waste events. And then our school district, the administrators in the school district have been great and STEM explorers and resource wise programs have given us curriculum and energy saving tools and physical items such as recycle bins. So we just really appreciate all of these partners that we have. And then I'd like to end with some ideas for um, calls to action. Um, the first would be to just start at home. If you have kids, get them involved and model sustainable habits for them. And then once they're interested in keeping our earth healthy, um, have them go to the schools or the district and email or write letters or talk to them. And I have an example up here of a letter from a former Eagle Crest student who now lives in Wisconsin. And this letter is asking his new school district to implement a Green Star program in Wisconsin. So I think that's really powerful for kids to do. Um, community members and parents can contact their school or in the school district and also get in touch with um, EcoCycle to become a Green Star School. There's a wait list and a process, but the email is right there and that will be um, linked in the notes also. And so that is it for me. Thanks for listening um, and allowing me to participate in this. That was great, Stephanie. So inspiring. Um, so put any questions for Stephanie in the Q and A. Um, one note about Green Star Schools is SRL is working on bringing more Green Star Schools to Longmont. So if you're interested in that, then um, please be a part of this project. So great, everybody, thank you. Naomi, Dan, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and for all of the great work that you're doing in our community. Um, so we've got some links going up for Stephanie. And um, yeah, so as we're waiting for um, audience questions, we have some for you as well. Um, so we wanted to ask each one of you what the impact has been so far um, of COVID-19 on the work you're doing, specifically um, any opportunities that have come to mind or um, you know, using this time to pivot, transform your work um, to maybe reach more people or yeah. So um, Naomi, do you wanna start? Sure, I can take this first. Um, I mentioned very briefly in my presentation about some of the changes we've made uh, due to the coronavirus. Um, we had to really rework uh, a lot of our distribution models, figure out how to safely provide food, but at the same time having um, a lot of people out of work and uh, there, there was a higher need for food and there still is. Uh, we're seeing it continue on and probably for a while now there's a higher need uh, for food access. And so it was very important that we could continue our work but also protect our volunteers and protect the people we're uh, giving food to and working with. So um, a lot of that is 
you know, making sure everyone has PPE, everyone has the masks and the gloves and sanitizer and um, no contact drop off and pick up as much as possible, practicing social distancing, not being able to do the park uh, hangouts, but doing it in the parking lot and being able to space out the cars or the bikes, whoever's coming in to pick up food. Um, so it's been a little bit of restructuring, but there's just a huge amount of opportunity right now. So <clears throat> one of the things that we've done to expand is that in um, previous years, our produce in the parks were just once a month. And we've been offering produce in the parking lot twice a month now, um, and it seems still very popular. And so we're gonna continue that through the summer. And we've also identified some new recipient sites and some new partnerships that are, are looking to provide more food over the summer, um, especially with, you know, schools being out of session, there are some school foods that's being provided this month, but there is again going to be some gaps in service until school starts up again. And a lot of students, a lot of children get their meals through their school system. And so um, there are some, there's some programs that we're working with to help provide that. Um, and there's really been a lot of great funding opportunities, uh, emergency funding opportunities to help with food support right now because there's relief grants, uh, Hunger Free Colorado. Uh, there, there's just um, at the beginning of all of this in, in March and early April, there was a huge coming together of people saying, we're going to need to address this. And so um, we've, we're still looking at the long term, you know, what this is going to look like in a few months is um, are we going to have to be finding new funding sources, new food sources? Um, how is it disrupting the food supply chain? Initially, there was like a lot of food and then there's, you know, it can, it can change how the distributors are working with food during this crisis. So uh, it's, it's been exciting and there's a huge amount of opportunity, I think. Awesome. Stephanie, yeah, well, how yeah. different since you're not in school right now. I know. Um, I, I think the opportunity has just been to bring it home because we weren't able to do it at school. And so um, a lot of our kids, um, I hear from a lot of parents um, that they, the kids um, come home and they're, they say, you know, why aren't you recycling that? Or this needs to go in the compost or whatever. So I think just bringing it home. And um, we had opportunities to talk about it when we were doing online school. So I think that's kind of been where that, where that has been. And I think for the coming school year too, um, I think our big push is going to be more about don't take what you can't eat and pack really what only what you can eat um, or what you like because um, I'm not sure we'll be able to how much of the food rescue we'll be able to do with COVID mm -hmm. that will really emphasize the other part I think great thanks yeah I would think that um, since kids are home all day that there would be an even greater opportunity to spread the word and make sure that's good stuff's happening at home um, Dan, any thoughts on how the programs are being are impacted by COVID? Um, well, yeah, we were very impacted. Um, we had to, I'm also responsible for our, for our CHARM facility, the Center for Art and Recycled Materials, and we had that shut down for roughly a month, essentially the month of April. Um, and that was tough. Uh, we had to, you know, furlough some, some folks, including some drivers, because the drivers were impacted by that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we got through it and we got a, a small business loan. So um, extremely grateful for that. It was, it was a lifesaver. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's lots of silver linings. Um, I'm not going to include um, Zoom meetings as one of them because they have their downsides. I've been kicked off this three times, um, so I apologize for that, but, um, but uh, hey, I'm home. I guess that's okay. Um, so, um, but I think, um, you know, we've certainly had the opportunity uh, while we were closed for a month to uh, to make some some small improvements um, and to you know just kind of reconsider um, a lot of things that we do at Charm. Uh, as far as compost is concerned, um, you know I 
um, I think the silver lining remains to be seen. I, I was, we were very close to getting some legislation passed that would have really um, helped uh, get this, um, what I you know, make this connection between composting and climate change in agriculture. Um, and unfortunately, uh, COVID um, uh, caused us to, you know, a lot of the bills that that were um, that were in process got dropped. Um, so we'll have to bring that up next year. But uh, maybe it's, you know, I guess the silver lining there is it's it's uh, it's an opportunity to to reach out, especially in the agricultural realm, <clears throat> and uh, and get more um, uh, get uh, you know get more enthusiasm for that, uh, you know, across sectors. So um, you know, I think we're still adjusting and. Um, it's um, it's yeah it's a mis it's a mixed bag but we're um, but you know grateful to be to be back. Awesome. Um, we had a question um, for Stephanie and also Naomi if you want to chime in on this or Dan all of you actually um, what would it take to make all of Longmont's elementary schools Green Star schools? So um, Stephanie, do you want to start? Yeah, Wouldn't, that would be so awesome. <laughs> that, is, that is great. Um, I think, um, you know, educating the kids and then the kids take it home to their parents and talk to their parents about it. So I think that's huge. Um, I think getting feeder systems um, involved. So the elementary and then the middle and then the high school, if there's a continuum there, um, the kids who uh, have been at the elementary school will will bring it up with them. So I think that is would be powerful. Um, and you know maybe parents and community members talking to the schools about becoming Green Star and then getting on that wait list. I don't know how long that list is now, but um, getting on that list. Great, Naomi. You want to add anything? Yeah. Based on our zero waste committee meetings, my understanding is that one of the biggest barriers for all the Longmont schools uh, becoming Green Star schools right now is funding. I mean, the wait list exists because there's limited resources on EcoCycle side to um, implement these programs. They, you know, take time, resources, and it's also, you know, continual ongoing expense too to maintain it. There's the initial expense of of producing a, you know, the program in the school and getting all of these resources in and then maintaining it. So the biggest thing is to come together collectively, um, parents, teachers, administrators, talking to the school board, interested community, community members to come together and say, we want this in our school system. We, um, you know, we're a relatively well-to-do school district. We could do this. Um, we just need to have kind of the, energy, the will to come together and, and ask this, uh, this of the city council, of the, of the school boards, um, say this is something we want to do as a community. Excellent. Um, there will be a link that we'll put up um, a little bit later if people are interested in getting involved in helping us um, advocate for more Green Star schools. So um, the more voices we can bring to the district and school board, the better. Um, Dan, I don't know if you had anything to share. I know there's a whole um, program at EcoCycle that involves um, Green Star schools, but do you have any comment? Well, yeah, it, that's exactly right. It, it comes down to funding. It comes down to advocacy, advocating at the superintendent and school board level that, um, that it's a priority. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, that's, that, is, that is the barrier. Um, okay, well, we have time for a few more questions. So if people have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, Dan, maybe we'll stick with you for a moment. Um, so you shared that Colorado um, is doing pretty poorly as far as recycling rates. Um, what would you say are ways to change that? And um, also around composting, you talked about universal composting. Any thoughts on how we can make that happen in Longmont? Uh, well, um, Col looking at the, the state first, I think um, you know, Colorado is, as I say, challenged by um, super low landfill rates 
um, and a lot of a lot of uh, rural area. Um, so it is hard to it does have a major impact um, to to bring recycling and composting to um, to rural uh, parts of the state. Um, so I, I mentioned a bill that um, that was dropped in the legislature. We actually um, also got a bill passed um, that is that is focused on end markets, uh, building um, uh, end markets to create closed loops for materials in Colorado. We happen to have a great uh, closed loop for glass in Colorado. Uh, you can go uh, glass bottle to glass bottle in Colorado and never leave the state, uh, which is a really cool thing. Uh, and there's there's capacity for you know the entire state's generation of glass there. Um, at that facility, <clears throat> um, we need more of that. We need um, we need more um, secondary processing. So that we do the the primary sort of the eco cycle. Then we need to we need local places to turn that into um, new products. So um, so this uh, bill um, works towards that. It's it it's it's essentially a, um, you know, create a, a research entity to. Um, to look specifically at how do we how do we stimulate in markets in Colorado, um, in terms of Longmont Universal Zero Waste, you know I think there there is definitely some support there, um, and I think um, you know talking to City Council, um, I know I know there's some um, there's definitely interest on the staff level, um, so I don't think there'd be a lot of pushback there. I think it's it's again it's mostly um, you know go to the the highest level, go to the um, go to City Council. And, um, and and tell city council that um, you know opt in is a is a great first step and and that's the way it was looked at you know when when that was passed um, you know that's a you know we're getting to about the limit to what opt in can do I think so uh, so now it's time to take the next step and I think and city council needs to hear that there is support for that. Great. All right. Well, that's a big part of what SML will be working on. Um, we're hoping to have a, um, well, there will be at some point a meeting. We're thinking it's going to be in August. Um, Naomi, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, we don't quite have the details yet because it hasn't been set, but when the meeting occurs, we're going to try to get a group of people together, whether it's going to be a, you know, probably a web meeting versus an in-person city council meeting um, to give public comment on on what we want and the, that we are looking for universal composting and, and as opposed to opt-in and um, also I would love to do some work around addressing the uh, the multi-family unit issue that uh, Dan talked about a little bit because we I think we can do better in that realm as well um, and so we will be uh, through our zero waste committee uh, getting uh, anyone who wants to help participate in, in this process of advocating for, for universal composting and also for Green Star Schools. Um, we're gonna have opportunities for how you can have your voice heard by city council and by school uh, board. So I think Rachel, you have some, some links and stuff we can share for that. Yeah, so great. Thanks everybody for your um, thoughtful answers. So we put together some next, next steps for action. Um, so starting conversations with your family, your neighbors, your communities, your churches, at work, um, restaurants you go to about food waste and food rescue. Volunteer with Longmont Food Rescue or any local food rescue organization. Um, sign up for Longmont's curbside composting program if you're not already um, signed up for that. Reduce your bin size and the amount of money you spend on getting rid of your trash. Um, support a Longmont Universal Zero Waste Ordinance, so that will be something that SRL will really be working on. Um, compost at home, in your backyard, get a worm bin, have fun. <laughs> creepy crawlies, advocate for more Longmont Green Star schools. Definitely, that makes such a huge impact. And as you know, those elementary school kids learn um, those tools that they'll take with them for the rest of their lives. Talk, email, write letters to teachers and school administrators. Um, yeah, there are definitely schools that are interested. And so I think um, 
and, and EcoCycle is aware of those schools, so we can, um, SRL and this whole community can help support that process and join SRL Zero Waste Committee. Um, so we'll have that information about um, where to sign up for that. Um, and we have one more question. Are data on diversion rate available publicly for single entities like CU? Um, Dan, do you know anything about that? Private companies or organizations and, and what they're doing about diversion rates? Uh, well, CU, I'm sure, tracks their, their diversion rate. They do, they have their own um, recycling facility there and, and certainly they do, um, uh, they do uh, track their data. Um, we, it's not gathered um, uh, formally because they are, um, you know, CU happens to be part of the state, so I think you, you probably can um, get that information from them. If you're a private entity, uh, you know, it's up to you whether you want to share that information. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you contact CU Recycling, um, I'm sure they would share that um, information specifically for CU. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so just a couple more things wrapping up. Thanks everybody again for um, being here. And we wanted to um, uh, just give you some links for how to get involved with the Zero Waste Committee. So the link I just put up, um, there's a little form there that you can fill out and let us know if you're interested in Green Star Schools or in universal composting, attending our meetings. So um, check that out. We will have this webinar up on our um, website as well, that same <clears throat> website, as well as we have a YouTube channel. Um, and we'd love people to sign up for our newsletter um, where we'll keep you up to date with all of the great work that SRL is doing. So you can sign up for that there. And then finally, um, we are a nonprofit and rely completely on donations and grants. And um, so anything that you can donate today is great. We do have um, a membership amount of $25 a year, but any amount helps. So here is the link um, to donate through PayPal. And um, yeah, we're a community run organization, totally focused on local Longmont issues. So we would love your support and uh, help making a difference in bringing Longmont to be a zero waste city, reduce emissions, um, and avoid the worst effects of climate change and go green. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, I do have this last slide to bring up. Um, any other final thoughts before we close? Here we go. Thank you. There's our links to donate as well. So Stephanie, Naomi, Dan, so great to have you here and hope to see you soon. I'll keep up the good work. Thank you, Rachel. I just wanted to mention someone had asked about having access to the slides I was presenting. And um, I believe we can add those to our zero waste page as well where the webinar will be hosted. So if you want to revisit either the webinar or the slides, we will uh, we'll post those on that same link, the zero waste uh, page of the SRL Longmont, SRL Longmont <laughs> org. Perfect. All right. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.